We're going to go through uh, the water topic uh, now about um, water. I got assigned to do that uh, job, and I suppose it's a bit it's a bit disjointed the um, um, discussion, but it's more about what people have been asking me at work, and I've, I've looked up and seen some of the rules and regs around accessing water in rivers and and your dam rights, etc. So um, harvestable dam rights, <laughs> so not your dam rights. <laughs> Uh, so this is a three-month uh, forecast from BOM, of course. I suppose most of you guys have seen this on the BOM website underneath the agricultural side of things. Um, it's predicting a 35% chance of getting our average rainfall over the next three months. Always look at these two maps together. One's about the accuracy on their prediction. And um, generally on the coast, in this time of year with storm events, etc., They've got a 50-50 accuracy on that prediction of the rain in the next three months. So we could get a storm and change that average rainfall for the month on your property, but maybe not on your next door neighbours. So it's a bit variable for us right on the edge of the, at the coast there. You can see that lighter line there, but the rest of the state's pretty much around 65 to 70% accurate on that prediction. That'll be 35% below their uh, average rainfall on those lighter areas and worse in the darker areas. So it's not a great uh, prediction and I suppose that's why we're all worried at the moment about the continuing of the drought and the decisions around that continuing drought rather than maybe it's going to get break and we'll get a good rainfall. If the map was a different colour, I'd be saying a different thing, of course. So I thought uh, currently, since we've had two dry winters in a row, our water resources on our farm have depleted and most of our dams are at 40% capacity or less, I suppose. And there is a thing about harvestable right, I don't know whether you've all heard about that, but you have got a, an amount of water you can store on your property in dams and some of you might be at that harvestable right and some might not be. And I thought while you're going around looking at your water resources currently, you might as well have a look at your harvestable right as well. So in the recovery, you might be able to build some extra dams on your property. So this is off the Water New South Wales website. It's the process you go to to determine your harvestable right. They've got a map there that you locate your property on. You put in your hectares and it gives you a harvestable right area there, which is in megalitres. Generally it works out for this area, about 10% of your hectare area, 100 hectares, you've got 10 megalitres of water to store on your property. So you could ask, access, have a look at all your dams at full capacity currently, see if you're up to that 10 megalitres or less, or whatever your harvest right is. So to work out how much water is in your dam, it's a little bit of a, the old maths, you know, length by by width sort of and depth, except for a triangle dam, which was divided by two. So um, to work out the surface area and then how much water you have in the dam, and you can go around each dam site with a tape or, or step it out and work out how much each dam, how much water is in each dam at full capacity. And yeah, so a triangle dam I measured was 20 metre wall width 50 metres down to the tail and five metres deep, and that equaled one megalitre. A fairly reasonably sized dam. So, yeah, that's, that's what I just explained. So, yeah, 500 square metres surface area, and they multiplied by 0.4 to account for the slope of the batter in the dam, and that came up with one megalitre. Uh, that's all explained on that Water New South Wales website as well. Uh, how much is a megalitre if you just want to have a look at it and think you can guess it, I suppose? It's one cubic metre equals a thousand litres of water and there's a thousand cubic metres to a megalitre. A half, an Olympic swimming pool, but Olympic swimming pools are the same depth all the way through, so haven't got a shallow end. So, and one megalitre is four inches of rain on a hectare, so... A lot of the smaller farm dams you might think are a megalitre, but they're probably about a third of a megalitre. The ones up the gullies and that, because they're pretty shallow. Uh, so Linda, I went a bit around the water requirements for stock. So you would have uh, around about 80 to 100 litres per cow drinks a day. And of course, anything smaller, a bit less. Wieners, 55 litres. 
You've assessed your dams at um, their full capacity. Have a guess at what their current capacity is. Might be at 60% or 40%. Uh, take a little bit off for evaporation over the next period and for water fouling, stock access. And it ends up you have to take around about 50, 45 to 50% off the original calculation. And so 400 and half a megalitre, say, would support 25 cows and calves for 216 days. 50 cows, of course, 108 days. So it gives you a bit of an idea of how much water you have on your place. Um, before it gets down to the crunch time and you say, oh, I've run out of water. What am I going to do now? Get the driller in and see if I can find a, a borehole or something to find water. As a dairy farmer in my oil recently did and the borehole come into action just as the dam run out of water, just in time. So, uh, but he turns the hose on, he doesn't know how much water's in the bore. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty risky. So, I'm just saying to um, use your harvest right calculation so you can choose a good dam for pumping into the future. If you've got some more capacity to increase your dam size, then look for a good place. If you haven't already got a good dam on your property, restrict access from that dam to maintain its water quality because you're preparing for another drought sometime in the future. Ensure your dam has good, got good depth rather than a huge surface area and located centrally in the upper catmint. Did you pick on that? Yeah. So I did that last night, so I've missed that spelling in the upper catchment to reduce your head of pumping. So if you need to get it up in, you know, up in the ridge areas and upper slopes, uh, water troughs, it's very handy during a drought because they're generally chasing that drier feed and you can add some of those uh, loose slicks and stuff that um, Ian was talking about this morning if you've got good abundant feed up there, that, but it's a bit uh, lower quality. So where can you build one of these extra dams if you need to it, uh, without um, applying for a licence where you can just get the contractor in and say build a dam there. Um, it's based on a stream order system. You can build a dam on a first and second stream order without any approval, um, but you need approval anything lower than that. I'll show you what stream orders are. I've drawn this on Google Earth. You, you can't access it on any website, but if you get a topographical map, you'll see blue lines on that map. First order stream is not a stream that is flowing. It's more a dry gully that flows water when it rains. And when two of those dry gullies meet up together in one point, that turns that stream into a second order stream. So it's building up to a stream that flows all the time. And anything bigger than that's a third order stream, which is probably one of those spring fed streams on your place that pretty much flow all year round unless it gets really dry. So you can build a dam on any of those first order streams or second order stream, but you need approval for any of these ones. And as you can see, there's a big dam there, 12 megalitres, that's a approved licensed irrigation dam. So um, that's why that was allowed in that spot. Albert, are the streams named, the main streams that you can't? None of those streams on that map are named. So once you're in a named stream, it's probably way, you know, the stream at the end of all those streams where they meet to the little creek is named. Do you, do you give the order back from, say, a recognised river, or do you start? Start from the upper catchment and work your way down and, and add your stream orders up as you start from the top as one. It's a lot easier than starting from the stream order six or seven and working your way back the other way. Yeah, so, some of the streams could be kilometres away from your property. Yeah, get a topographic map and you'll have to work out where your stream comes from in your property into the neighbours and count the stream orders up as it comes down into your property. So when you need a water access licence, as I said, on the higher end streams, you need one to uh, actually get a constructor bore before he starts drilling. You have to go on the website, Water New South Wales one. There's an online application there and you can apply before the guy, he'll tell you, you need that before he drills for underground water. I think it costs around $280, $300 or something. And you can use any natural water sources for stock and domestic without getting approval, like out of a river or creek, pump. 
uh, but it can't be used for irrigation, or intensive livestock, uh, commercial price, commercial purposes without a licence. Um, and there's more detail on the water website, fact sheets and stuff about all this stuff. So some people have uh, living on rivers and they need to access water at their original pumping site and suddenly the foot valves um, are not in the water anymore and the water's trickling through the gravel bed and they can't access a hole deep enough to put their foot valve in. So this is an allowable activity where you don't need approval for. Uh, so you can excavate your hole where you pump from, but don't put the machine in the river. It's from the bank, an excavator. No deeper than a metre deep. You need to place the material you dig that hole with on the uh, top side of the current. So when it floods, it flows back into the hole. And it needs to be no wider than a third of the width of the river. Or six metres, whichever is lesser, depending on how big the river is. Um, so um, the material you excavate has to be just the loose sand and gravel in the riverbed. So you can't go and dig a five metre hole in the river and pump out of it. It's just, uh, yeah, be a bit careful and you've got to limit the amount of disturbance on the banks, etc. while you're doing it. So uh, I've given that sort of a fact to some contractors that were asking that question recently. So we've got um, Dry conditions, dry feed, stock said they uh, drink 80 litres, these sort of things with uh, salt and everything else out there increases their intake and coming into summer will also increase their intake. So if you're working off water troughs or haven't got clean water sites, remember that water quality is important so they can intake that water they need. Uh, so uh, regular cleaning of troughs, etc., during warmer conditions is imperative up to every third day or once a week, at least. And look, watch out for algae and stuff in things. If you've uh, drilled a bore or something and you want to ch check your water quality, then we have water sampling kits in the office you can pick up. We don't pay for the sample, but at least we've got the kits. You can pick them up and send them away yourself and get your water sample tested up at Wollongbar. And if you give you advice on the minerals or salts in the water and how much stock can tolerate of those sort of elements in the water before they get diarrhoea or something else. So that's available. Um, you can also try, if you've got dams that are boggy, try um, fencing off to an access point where you've put in some rock so they can use that as a ramp to get down to the water as a, a way to do something quickly. Uh, that hasn't got a fence around it. That's a, that's a that's a crossing, but it sort of gives you the example of what I'm talking about. So sort of maintain that water quality. You'll still have to keep an eye on it, but at least you'll get stock into low boggy spots uh, a li little bit easier. Uh, so this is what I'm saying we should be doing is get a good reliable dam, fence it off, keep stock out of it to maintain your water quality, put a series of troughs around your place that are quick fill and easy to clean and um, as you rotate cattle around turn them off and let them dry out and turn on the new ones in the next paddock. Maintain their access to natural water systems just in case your uh, trough breaks down but at least you've got that nice clean water there they can drink at any time without getting bogged and I, most people tell me when they do this cattle prefer to drink out of the trough then at the de uh, dam or creek. So we'll have a look at where you're going to place those troughs. So this is a dam, isolated dam in the back of a gully and it's caught you all around it. So yeah, another thing you could do with your troughs is put in a location where you could transfer nutrients from one spot of the farm to another and uh, you could have another good caught you area on a mid ridge place or something like that because cattle are just congregating around that spot. So think about those things, keep those um, places away from water which has already got that Kaiku area there, so another thing to think about. Um, and have them on the upper slopes, as I said before. Cattle generally um, eat on the lower slopes in the good conditions, and you've always got some dry feed in those upper slopes, but they can't get up there in the dry, expend too much energy to get up there, coming back down and forward to get water. So put your water up as high as you can get it, get a good pump that will do that, and um, then you can uh, 
use your loose slicks and elastic slicks, etc. Buy you a bit of time in the drought before you really get hard into it now as we're getting in there now. Uh, there's heaps of different pumps available now that we didn't have 15 years ago. Helical rotor pumps, solar pumps, uh, you know, you use pumps that have great long suction things and everything else. And the one there which works on the current of the flow of the river. So I think we covered the confinement feeding stuff. So I suppose the important part is to make sure that your trough can actually has enough access to it for the 10% of the cattle you have in the confinement area. Make sure it's on the edge of the of the yard so when you do clean it out and empty it, the water goes straight out of the yards and doesn't bog your yard up because uh, you'll be cleaning that trough pretty regularly and keep it about 10 metres away from your grain feed bin source so um, it gives you a bit more, a uh, few more days before you have to clean it out because uh, the grain does get in there pretty quickly and uh, destroys the water quality. Yeah, so that was all about that. Um, so yeah, make sure it's a good trough, protected uh, ball tr uh, cock systems are protected from stock playing with them. There's some really good ones today that are well covered, so get a good one for a confinement area, spend the money on it, and uh, you should be okay for quality water. So I think that that's, I think we've covered that, to watch out for algal growth in troughs and dams. Uh, and generally that's affected by nutrients that are going in the dams. So, um, and when you're putting in your new water systems, probably best you put them in when you are in good conditions. It's a bit late now, but you can still put them in, but cattle generally might not know where they are. So make sure you take care in that they do find out where they are. I put some new troughs in the other day and the cows skirted around at about 50 metres, thought it was a flying saucer or something. So. Uh, uh, hopefully they'll find it when they get thirsty enough, but um, yeah, just keep monitor that. So when you put something new in your paddock, they actually know what it is. And it's good if you can get in there when they've got other places of water and they'll find it during the year. So this is just a bit of an example of what I did on my place. Uh, a few months ago, thinking that I would be low on water in the um, back paddocks, remote, more remote paddocks. The creeks were drying up into little puddle holes and I thought I'll have to do something soon. So I investigated the solar pump. I think it's a fantastic thing. There's some guys I've had um, around Gloucester that have these sort of things in for five years now and they've had n little problem with them. Uh, they're reasonably cheap. That's a $3,500 cost of a pump. It's a 128 metre head it pumps to. And um, I put it in a one and a half inch pipe and it's filling a tank up, 2,000 gallon tank up in four hours every day. So, and I don't have to watch it and then it keeps my troughs full all the time because the tank's basically another pressure tank. So this is what I did. It's for 800 metres of piping, one and a half inch. The pump's in the middle there where the dam is. Pumps to the tank. And then the tank, I've got some non-return valves in this system. Use one single line, not two lines. And the tank fills up. Once it pressurises, the solar pump cuts out. I've got a little pressure tank on the solar pump. And then the tank operates the water system until the sun comes out again and then away she goes again. So it's a great system if you're thinking of uh, putting in some sort of pump in a remote dam where you haven't got electricity and you don't want to put, you know, start a firefighter every day. Um, and the solar pump, of course, in an electric pump, you need a duty cycle. You know, you might want to pump for two hours, so your ball cocks will be a double one in the tank where it won't start until it goes down a few um, a metre in the tank and then it'll pump and fill the tank, but a solar pump cuts in and out all the time, so you don't need to really worry about that either. So, because um, it's uh, just a great, great system I've found. So, if you, I rang up the guy. He told me what one to get. There's a whole selection on his website, but... Once you work out, if you want one, ring him up. He'll tell you what to get. Comes up in a kit. You have to put it all together yourself. Wire it in. Ask three or four questions back to the bloke because you don't understand the directions and uh, eventually you'll get it going. So uh, it's a great thing. So yeah, three or four panels. More tanks up on top of that hill. The dam's down the bottom down here. And um, pumps up that hill. Pipe above ground or trenched in? Oh, I trenched it in. Yeah, trenched in. But if you're in a rush, you could 
throw a bit above the ground, especially when you're coming to your troughs. How long are they guaranteed for? Uh, I think there's a two-year guarantee on them. But... Jeez. How long to get out of a firefighter and those sort of things as well. So. And I don't have to cart uh, five litres of petrol over every, every day to fill the pump up and get it going. So, so yeah, it's just, just a, uh, goes in the top of the tank. I've got a non-return valve into the bottom that feeds the troughs. And uh, keep your tanks well covered and get one that's dark inside when you close it all up so it, no sunlight, so algae doesn't grow in there. If you stuff up your water quality in your tank, and it travels to all your troughs. The, I believe there is some sort of uh, capsules you can put in your tank for, uh, to prevent algae. I haven't investigated that yet, but I will be. Um, I think you can get them. I have seen them around somewhere. So I know you can get them for swimming pools. So I suppose you get them for stock water systems, but um, you have to find that out. What you say the cheap cost? Three and a half, wasn't it? Three and a half, yeah, for that pump. Um, That's solar panels, the whole kit together. I paid an extra $200 for the little pressure tank that cuts the solar yeah. pump in and off. It does come with its own switching mechanism, but you have to run a wire all the way to your tank from the pump, which mine was 400 metres away, so I wasn't doing that. But the little pressure tank works fine. It's got a little cutout switch on the side of it with, the, with a pressure, pressure gauge on it. And as soon as it gets, as soon as it pressurises your, everything's off and it pressurises the pipe, <coughs> a couple of more PSI above what the, what the, um, the running um, PSI in the pipe is, when everything's going, it cuts the pump out. Yeah, poly pipe's on top of that. That's just for the pump set up and um, yeah. But you know, you save a bit of money by only using one pipe to do the whole show and um, you know, you can get cheap water troughs if you're a bit inventive of bathtubs and things like that. Uh, and. Um, you can get some water out there fairly cheaply. Once you get your pump going, the pump's the most important part of the whole system. <laughs>